and welcome everyone to this uh, special live stream which we are hosting on the Carl Sagan Institute's YouTube channel all about planets around white dwarfs. So in today's live stream we're mainly going to be focusing on answering your questions about the existence and properties of planets orbiting these smoldering cores of long dead stars. So uh, my name is Ryan MacDonald. I'm a research associate at the Carl Sagan Institute in Cornell University. And uh, we are joined today by Dr. Thea Kazakis and also uh, Dr. Andrew Vandenberg. So um, we'll start by just going around and introducing ourselves. So Thea, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what your research involves? Sure, so I'm Thea Kazakis. I very recently got my PhD at the Carl Sagan Institute at Cornell University. I just started, oh, hi dad, he's commenting on this. Um, so I just started a research position at the Technical University of Denmark. So you might see the sun go down a bit in my windows during this. And what I spent most of my thesis on was studying what habitability for planets around white dwarfs would look like. So of course, I'm very, very excited at Andrew's discovery of finding a planet around the white dwarf because usually when I research these objects, they didn't exist yet. So that's what I've been focusing on. What would an Earth-like planet look like around a white dwarf with different spectrum? And how would we be able to detect life around such a planet? Thanks very much. And uh, Andrew, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Andrew Vanderberg. I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and I study exoplanets in general, mostly from the observational side. So I use data from space telescopes and I try to use that data from the telescopes in space and also telescopes on the ground to figure out what are the planets outside of our solar system like? What happens to them when their stars die? And are there any planets outside of our solar system that might be anything like the ones in our own solar system and maybe even like Earth? And it's also great to see all of you joining us today from all around the world. So let's see, we have people coming in from England, from Spain, from Finland, and from India. Um, by all means, throughout the live stream, just tell us where you're from. And um, if you have any questions at any point throughout our live stream, just drop them over there in the chat, and we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. So you might have seen in the news last week a quite big discovery, namely the first time that an intact giant planet has been discovered passing in front of a white dwarf. Uh, Thea, could you tell us a little bit about what a white dwarf actually is and how it's different to other stars that we might be more familiar with? Sure. So when we talk about white dwarf stars, we usually say that they're dead, which is a bit odd because usually you wouldn't think of a star being alive. So when we say the star is dead, what we mean is that there isn't any nuclear fusion occurring within the star like our sun. So one day our sun is going to die. In about five billion years, it's going to expand as a red giant. It will destroy Earth, but that's a long time from now. So please don't be concerned about that. We have more pressing issues in today's world, but after fusion completely stops in our sun, it's going to cast off its outer layers and become what we call a white dwarf. So at this point, it's a very small object. It's only a little bit bigger than Earth, which is very relevant to Andrew's discovery. And it doesn't have any internal heat source. So although it starts off very, very hot, the white dwarf is going to slowly cool down over time. So it might start off as like 100,000 degrees, but after 2 billion years, it's about the temperature of our sun, at which point it's cooling very slowly. And I see someone's asking how far away the Goldilocks zone, the habitable zone is around a white dwarf. And it's very, very close once it's cooled down to about the temperature of our sun and has become stable. So it would be around 0 0.01 astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is the Earth's sun distance. So less than 1% the distance between us and the sun. So an object, in the white dwarf habitable zone is going to complete an orbit usually twice a day. So very, very fast year. And these white dwarfs are basically just being held up by something we call electron degeneracy pressure. So similarly to how when you pack for a trip, there's a limit to how much you can shove in your suitcase. There's a limit to how fast, how, sorry, tightly we could pack in electrons. So instead of fusion holding up the star, it's literally just electrons. Um, that's basically all the white dwarf is, is it's just sitting there 
slowly cooling over time. And I see we have a question from Miko coming in as well, also about white dwarfs that uh, might be a good time to address. So uh, are there solar flares on white dwarfs or are they more stable compared to the sun and red dwarf stars? That's a very good question. And like I said, this is an object that's very different from the sun. It doesn't have fusion going on. So it doesn't have flares or things like that on a white dwarf. It doesn't have any sunspots like most stars have. And because of that, they're in some ways more stable, which could make it easier for us to detect planets around them. So that's definitely something we think about because as we know, solar flares could have a lot of UV flux and might not be the best for life. So speaking about planets around white dwarfs, Andrew, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your discovery, which was in the news last week, and a little bit about the, the story behind how you found this planet around a white dwarf? Wolf. Sure. Yeah. So I mostly study planets that transit their star. And what that means is that if you have a star like my hand and your planet orbits like this, and it just happens to be lined up so that it goes in between the star and our telescopes, then we see exactly like this animation. Then we see the light dim from our point of view. And I used to not be very interested in white dwarfs in particular until I kind of came across one by accident while I was in graduate school. We looked at it closely and eventually we figured out that what was happening is that there was a planet or maybe a minor planet or an asteroid orbiting that white dwarf that was in the process of getting destroyed. It was being ripped apart by that white dwarf's gravity. And we could see this happening as it blocked the light from our point of view. So ever since then, I've been interested in what happens to planets after their stars finish, uh, use up all of their hydrogen fuel and eventually evolve into white dwarfs. So when we started looking at new data from NASA's TESS mission, which is the successor to NASA's Kepler mission, which is what we used to make the original discovery, I was mostly looking for more examples of planets being destroyed or planets being torn apart. So I wasn't necessarily expecting to find anything that was uh, intact. So I was observing on a telescope one night uh, remotely and I was looking through data from NASA's test mission as it came down and one of the detections that it had caught my eye. It was this very characteristically short transit. It was a dimming of light on a white dwarf star that only lasted for about eight minutes and that was enough to make me think maybe something was going on here. So I sent some emails. I asked a couple of amateur astronomers uh, if they would be willing to observe the star with their telescopes in their backyards. They have complete control over those telescopes so they can get on stuff very quickly and figure out what's going on very rapidly. And pretty soon we figured out that indeed there was this dip, this transit happening on this white dwarf. We weren't entirely sure what was going on for a while though because when we calculated how large this planet must be, we figured out that it was about the size of Jupiter. And objects that are about the size of Jupiter can be lots of different things. Planets can be about the size of Jupiter, but also brown dwarfs, which are kind of like failed stars. They're more massive than planets, but not quite massive enough to start fusing hydrogen on their own. They're also about the size of Jupiter. And then if you go even more massive and start adding more and more mass to a brown dwarf, the very lowest mass stars, the very smallest stars in our galaxy are still about the size of Jupiter. So this object could have been any one of those things. To figure out what was going on, we used NASA's Spitzer telescope to look for heat from this object. Spitzer observes in infrared wavelengths, which is where cool objects kind of like the Earth and kind of like uh, you know, the, you know, our bodies emit much of their radiation. And because we didn't see any extra glow from this object from Spitzer, we knew it had to be cold and therefore it had to be relatively lightweight. And this is how we were able to conclude that this was probably a planet. And so you mentioned that one of the first things you did to try and confirm the tentative signal was to use um, some small ground-based telescopes. How large were these? Like how easy is it for just, is this something can an amateur see a white dwarf or, yeah, how easy or hard is it to actually observe these objects? White dwarfs are actually great targets for amateur astronomers 
provided that you live in a place that has relatively dark skies. And the reason for that is even though white dwarfs themselves are intrinsically very dim, the signals that planets cause when they go in front of the white dwarfs are huge, much larger than the signals that they would cause around stars like our sun. So because of that, amateur astronomers can get really nice data. And the telescopes that were used by the amateurs who worked with us in our study were 14 inches, 14 inches, and I believe 32 inches. So they're relatively large in terms of amateur telescopes. And they were in a pretty good site. These amateurs live in Southern Arizona where the skies are dark and the weather is very good. Uh, but it's certainly possible to detect these transits with uh, small telescopes. And if you have a relatively dark sky, it should be straightforward to do so. And we've had a question about the detectability of these objects, but more, more focused on the noise. So this question, how do you account for the signal noise from sources apart from the exoplanet and the white dwarf? Yeah, so that's where these amateur astronomers were really helpful. So TESS, the spacecraft that we used to detect the signal originally, is a fantastic instrument. But its goal is not necessarily to pinpoint where signals come from. It's just to find the signals themselves. And because of this, it's... Uh, its resolution is pretty low. Its images are quite blurry. We can see that there's a dip in brightness, but it could have been coming from any number of a handful of stars. So when our amateur colleagues observed this star from the ground, they were able to pinpoint exactly which star it came from. And we're able to say that the transit signal, the dip that we saw in brightness, definitely came from the white dwarf instead of other, any of these other nearby stars. And what, one question that I, I got yesterday, actually, was why didn't Kepler discover planets around white dwarfs? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's a couple of answers. The first one, and possibly the most important one, is that when Kepler was flying, we didn't actually know of that many white dwarfs in our sky. In the last couple of years, there's been a revolution by a spacecraft called Gaia, which was launched by the European Space Agency. And what Gaia has done is it's multiplied the number of white dwarfs that we know about by factors of five. So before we knew of only uh, maybe 30,000 white dwarfs. Now we know of hundreds of thousands of these objects, which means that we can target them carefully with our instruments like TESS. Another reason is that TESS is able to look at more area of the sky at a time than Kepler was. Kepler was very focused on one part of the sky, but TESS looks at the entire sky. So we can target all of the white dwarfs across the sky that we know about, not just the ones that happen to fall in Kepler's field of view. And finally, this is an important one as well, is that TESS takes data more rapidly than Kepler does. And that's because TESS is a satellite. TESS orbits Earth, so it's very close to us. Kepler orbited the sun, continues to orbit the sun, and is much further away from Earth. So it takes a lot longer to beam data down from Kepler than it does from TESS. So with Kepler, we had to be very careful about what data we beamed down. And one of the ways we saved information was by taking longer exposures and only taking a measurement of brightness every 30 minutes. The test takes measurements of brightness every two minutes, and in some cases now every 20 seconds. And that means it's a lot easier for us to find the very fast transits of white dwarfs, which are much harder to detect than the ones of stars like our sun, which last for a couple of hours. Well, and uh, keep sending in your questions, everyone. There's uh, quite a, a queue that we're, we're building up. In particular, there's this one that just came in from Sam L about Earth-like planets around a white dwarf, and we will get to some of your questions from slightly earlier on as well. But I just wanted to uh, touch upon this, since this is the subject of the companion paper that we also released last week, focusing on the question of the hypothetical possibility of rocky planets orbiting around white dwarfs. Now, I should clarify that we have not yet found any intact rocky planets around white dwarfs. But um, what we studied in our companion paper, the called the White Dwarf Opportunity, was the prospects for characterizing the atmospheres 
of rocky planets around white dwarfs if they are eventually discovered in the future, which is one of the really exciting things about Andrew's discovery of the first giant planet around a white dwarf. Because during a transit, so this, this is to scale here, this is what you would see if you were looking at the Earth transiting a white dwarf. And they're very similar in size. So what this means is that a large fraction of the atmosphere of the planet passes in front of the white dwarf, so we can get very strong atmospheric signals, meaning that future telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope, which we all hope will finally launch next <laughs> year, will be able to easily characterize the atmospheres of planets orbiting white dwarfs using the suite of instruments that it, it has on board, if we can discover them. So uh, with that kind of spiel there, we're now going to kind of jump back and look at some of your questions. So how about this question? So do we think white dwarfs can still maintain planetary systems or will the violence of their formation prevent this? So uh, would you like to try tackling this, Thea? Sure, so this is a really good question and it is the question that most people ask first, so I'm not surprised to see it here. So I believe that if there is a planet close to a white dwarf, there's two different possibilities for it being there. One is that the planet was part of the original star system, but it started much farther away. So sort of like this planet that Andrew has found, it probably formed much farther away from the star and migrated inward over time. So we know that planets migrate inward, mainly because there's this class of exoplanets called hot Jupiters. So as you might've guessed from the name, they're Jupiter-like planets that orbit really close to their stars. So they're very hot. And these were the first exoplanets that astronomers found. And it was really shocking because everything we knew about planet formation said, oh, these planets should not form this close to the star. And that seems to still be true. The planets won't form that close to the star, but there's ways for planets to migrate their orbits inward. So one, the planet could have been in the outer solar system, planetary system, and moves closer after the white dwarf formed. Two, it's possible that the planet could have formed after the white dwarf formed. So we've seen disks of material around young white dwarfs, which reminds us a little bit about disks of materials we see around young stars. And out of those disks around young stars, that's where planets form. So it's possible that there are new planets that form out of these disks of material around the white dwarf. So this could be sort of a second genesis of life. So I'd say either starts far away, goes in, or it forms after the white dwarf forms. Anything originally in the interplanetary system would have been destroyed during the formation of the red giant right before the white dwarf, or as the white dwarf is forming with the planetary nebula. So, so the, two possibilities. To, to a question that we got on, on Twitter from um, Brad Cooper actually. On, yes. So his question was, how would a rocky planet atmosphere or life survive the so are we talking about the planet its atmosphere and life surviving the red giant phase and then somehow migrating in or are we talking about life itself being destroyed and then starting again so what happens to the planets and any life they have on them when when the star goes through the red giant phase so like I was saying earlier, if it started off much farther away from the star, it would have originally been sort of frozen. Although, as we see in our solar system, we have these icy moons in the outer solar system orbiting both Jupiter and Saturn. And yes, it's very, very cold there and they're frozen, but these moons do have liquid water oceans, albeit under the ice. And that's because they're orbiting a bigger planet and there's these tidal forces that are sort of stretching it out like a rubber band, creating friction and heating the ocean so it's not all ice. So I think that if there was life from the original planetary system that then migrated inward, it would have had to be a scenario like that. Because other than that, the planet would have to have originally been very, very cold in order to not be destroyed by the red giant. That's very interesting. So I'm just gonna take uh, this question here. How many white dwarfs do you hope to observe with JWST? It's important to emphasize first that JWST is not really a planet discovery mission. We would use that to follow up planets which have been discovered. So 
how many systems we end up looking with James will depend on how many planets we can hopefully find. Fortunately, we still have a little bit of time before James Webb launches in October of next year. And then even after it launches, it then goes through six months to commission. So you, we've got about two years or so. So uh, fingers crossed, um, we can find many more planets around White Dwarfs. Um, Andrew, you have a, a program to look for more planets around White Dwarfs with Tesserite. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing to try and find more of these objects? That's right. Yeah, so we think that Tess may be able to find uh, more planets like this one, now that we kind of know what to look for. And we're going to take advantage of two things. Now we have this complete census of white dwarfs in our galaxy, um, or in our nearby solar neighborhood from the Gaia mission. So let's look at as many of those as we possibly can. We've, as a result of our detection, felt a lot more confident that this is you know, a good use of the telescope time. So we've asked for many, many more observations. We have thousands of white dwarfs coming up that we hope to search for planets like this. And we expect to get that data down in the next year or two. And the other thing that's going to help us with tests is now we have access to even faster data than we did before. For the first two years of its mission, TESS was only able to download uh, images every two minutes for a handful of stars. Now we can get some stars with data every 20 seconds, and that will increase our sensitivity even more. So hopefully, if there are any planets out there and these white dwarfs that we're targeting, we should be able to find them in the next year or two as TESS takes more data. Great. Well, it would be fascinating to see, you know, how rare or common the, these objects actually are. And, and I know that was one of the, the issues that you, you had to contend with in your paper. How did WD1856b actually get to its current orbit, given that it's, well, it's close enough that its temperature is, what, like 160 or so Kelvin? But that's still ridiculously close to its, um, its uh, white dwarf host. So what are the leading ideas for how you even get a giant planet close to a white dwarf? Right. So the idea that we think is most likely is very similar to what Thea just talked about in terms of how hot Jupiters form. And it's kind of funny. We've been thinking about this question actually for the last 30 years. We just didn't realize that it also applied to white dwarfs. So if you have a planet far away from the star, how do you get it to come close in? And one of the explanations uh, that is uh, fa favored is that you have some sort of gravitational instability in the outer solar system. So imagine that you have a couple of planets. When the white dwarf becomes a white dwarf, when it loses a bunch of its mass by shedding the outer layers of the red giant, its gravity weakens. It's now no longer able to hold those outer planets in place as tightly as it could before. And what that means is that the influence of the outer planet's gravity on each other is proportionately larger. And when that happens, you can have planets that come a little bit too close and shoot one another in different directions. So one of the things that could happen is a planet could be sent out of the solar system. It could be ejected from the system. But another thing that could happen is it could be shot inwards and it could come very close to the star, just close enough that it gets a little bit stretched by the star's gravity when it gets close in. The stretching heats up the planet and that energy gets dissipated uh, as it radiates away. But if you repeat this process over and over and over again, where every time you come close to the star, you get stretched a little bit, you lose some energy and you swing back out, eventually that energy is coming out of the orbit and your planet will fall a little bit closer in every time it does that. So the idea is that over billions of years, maybe this process could take a planet that was orbiting as far out as Jupiter and have it end up in a short period orbit like we found for WD1856. Thanks very much for that. So uh, keep sending in your questions, everyone. Um, so uh, we have this question from Miko about how telescopes on Earth could potentially help us and even before James Webb launches. So um, I think we should probably answer this in two parts. So Andrew, could you start by telling us a little bit about the prospects just for finding planets using ground-based telescopes? And then I'll take um, on board the, the atmospheric part of it. Yeah, so TESS is not the only thing that can find planets, especially planets around white dwarfs. Uh, 
Test is really nice because it takes data 24 seven. It never misses a transit because it's always looking. But ground-based telescopes can also look for white dwarf planets. And if they happen to get lucky, if they happen to observe just the right time to see that planet cross in front of its star, then you would notice that as well. So there are these large surveys of uh, the sky being conducted and being built right now that may help us in this uh, endeavor as well. So one of these surveys is called the Zwicky Transient Facility. It's this, uh, th it's new giant camera. I don't know how many megapixels, but it's absolutely enormous. That's been installed at the Palomar Observatory in California. And what it does is it takes images of the sky in different places constantly looking for anything that changes. So the data from this uh, new telescope survey could help us find these very short dips in brightness. And coming on the horizon is the Vera Rubin Observatory, which was formerly known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST. And this is gonna be an even larger version of the Zwicky Transient Facility. It's gonna be a giant telescope, eight meters in diameter, and it's gonna have a giant camera. I forget, again, how many megapixels, but even bigger than, L uh, than ZTF. And based on this, it should take even more observations of even more white dwarfs, and we may be able to find additional dips that way. And I'll just get up the, uh, the question again. And um, when it comes to the atmospheric side, ground-based telescopes can do a lot um, for, for giant planets, for hot Jupiters. They've already helped to make some um, impressive discoveries of molecules in their atmospheres. The, the big drawback that you have is that uh, you, you can only really easily see in the wavelengths which are visible to our eye because the atmosphere of Earth filters out a lot of infrared wavelengths. And many of the molecules that we would like to study in exoplanet atmospheres, like uh, water, carbon dioxide, or even some molecules that can contribute to potential biosignatures like uh, methane and nitrous oxide, most of their strong absorption features are in the infrared. That being said, there are some molecules that we would uh, that we're, we're certainly keen to detect in rocky planet atmospheres, like oxygen and ozone, that do have strong absorption features in visible wavelengths. So there's a lot more work to be done to study the prospects for ground-based telescopes looking at rocky planet atmospheres, especially if it comes to white dwarf planets. But um, let's see if we can actually find the planets first. But I do think there is a lot of potential for ground-based facilities to work in harmony with James Webb. Um, yeah, because it will take us a while just to find these planets first. James Webb may already be up there before we have a good target, so we will have to see. Uh, there's a nice question here for, for you, Thea. Um, how would the conditions on planets around a white dwarf differ from the more familiar conditions around G-type stars like our sun? Yeah, so this is the question that I spent a lot of my PhD thinking about. So one of the things that would be different, we touched on a little earlier about the fact that the habitable zone, oh, sorry, I'm assuming, I'm thinking about habitable zone planets right now, that's always what I think about. So one thing is the white dwarf is a lot smaller. So if you want the planet to be warmer, it has to be a lot closer to the white dwarf because it's, it's just so tiny, it could barely radiate energy. So you'd have to be, a lot closer and the closer you are to a massive object, the more tidal effects that there are. So here's a beautiful animation. I believe this was to scale with a Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. So it'd be very, very close to the star. And here on Earth, we see the effects of tides from the moon with the ocean tides, but being that close to a star, the planet itself would most likely become tidally locked. So the moon is tidally locked tidally locked. And when we say that, what we mean is just the same face of that object is always facing us. So when we look up at the moon, no matter where it is in its orbit, the same side is always facing us. So if you had a planet that was tidally locked around its star, that means there's a permanent day side and a permanent night side. So that would be very different with things like atmospheric circulation. If the atmosphere is thick enough, it should be able to circulate enough that the day side isn't super hot and the night side isn't freezing. So maybe it would be a nice temperature all around. So the proximity would be something very different. Another thing about white dwarfs 
that would change planets around them is that the white dwarf is constantly cooling over time, which means things like the amount of UV flux the white dwarf is giving off are changing over the time. Because as an object gets dimmer and dimmer, it's giving off less ultraviolet radiation. And UV radiation is energetic enough that it can actually break apart molecules in our atmosphere. So the amount of UV reaching a planet is going to sort of determine the atmospheric chemistry of the planet. So for instance, here on Earth, one of the main things that is protecting us from UV coming down to the surface and killing all of us is our ozone layer. So that's why whenever we hear about things not going well in the ozone layer, we care about that because that's what's keeping us from being killed by UV. So what's interesting about ozone is it's actually being created by UV. So we have UV photons coming in, breaking apart oxygen molecules and recombining into ozone. So as the white dwarf cools over time, there's less and less UV. So a planet around a white dwarf would actually be creating less and less ozone over time. So those are some interesting implications for life. So I'd say that's the main thing that we have to think about when we think about how the atmosphere of a planet would be different around the white dwarf is the UV is different and that's gonna change what an Earth-like atmosphere is like, but it's also gonna change what the gas giant atmosphere is like with the amount of UV which I know, Ryan, you study gas giant atmospheres much more than me, so you could probably speak more to that. Mm -hmm. But I'd say the fact that the planet is orbiting a star that is continuously cooling is going to change things quite a bit. And I just noticed that we, we have here a, a slightly more technical question about white dwarfs themselves. So I don't know if either of you um, have any good ideas about this, but about how the, 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 the properties of white dwarf stars are especially so jets rotational speed and um whether the axis of rotation changes once a star has gone through the red giant phase yeah i can take some of this i think a lot of this is an open question as well um but in particular i know that the rotation speed of white dwarfs is not super extreme it's typically hours to days of rotation period which is really not that different from the rotation of some stars uh, on their main sequence, especially young stars that have just formed. So nothing super extreme there. Uh, jet cones, I think, are not likely to happen. Maybe in some cases where you have another star orbiting a white dwarf closely and you have mass stuff from that other star coming onto the white dwarf, you might get something like that. But generally, my feeling is that those phenomena are going to require stronger gravity than a white dwarf has and require, therefore, a smaller object, something like a neutron star or a black hole. And I think that we don't actually know if the rotational axis of the star is different for a white dwarf. I think that's an active area of research. Is the rotation of a star's core the same as the rotation of a star's outer layers? And people are using data from Kepler and TESS to try to figure that out by analyzing the way sound waves propagate through those stars. But I don't think there's a definitive answer yet. That's very interesting. And yeah, unfortunately, we haven't had our eyes on the universe for long enough to kind of watch a star go supernova and like measure how its rotational axis changes over time. But um, there are interesting creative avenues that we can do this. So a question here. So Thea, you, you mentioned about this second genesis idea for planets. So how should we visualize this? When when a star goes through the red giant phase, should we expect a new disk to appear and then planets to form from that? Or would this be a different mechanism of planet formation? So again, this is pure speculation because we haven't, we have found a planet around a white dwarf, but all the other ones were disintegrating. So we have observed these disks of materials around young white dwarfs. So yeah, I suppose there is a chance because they have a disk of material around them. Young stars have a disk of material around them that perhaps that's where the planets would form out of. We also know that for young white dwarfs that, like I said earlier, they're very, very hot. So they're giving off a lot of UV. And we have some ideas put forth that agree with our observations that the UV could be photo evaporating some more distant gas giants. So basically there's a lot of radiation, strong radiation coming off of the white dwarf and it sort of 
hitting the atmosphere of a gas giant and sort of taking it apart a bit, causing these materials to flow onto the white dwarf or into the inner white dwarf system. So maybe that could add to the disk as well. So again, this is also an active area of research, but it does look like the white dwarfs have disks around them. It could be possibly from the planetary nebula. So uh, planetary nebula is a really misleading name. So we know that bigger stars, when they die, they go supernova. That's more of a dramatic explosion. But for most stars, about 95% of stars, smaller stars, when they die, they have a planetary nebula, which is just the star sort of casting off its layers in a much less dramatic way than a supernova. So some of the material could be from the planetary nebula. Some of it could be from gas giants falling apart a little because of the strong radiation of the white dwarf. And perhaps that's where the planets are going to come from. That's also interesting to me because here on Earth, we ask ourselves a lot, where did the water come from? It looks like Earth early on might have been hot and dry. And we think that perhaps water was delivered later on by comets. So maybe for a planet to be habitable, it starts off hot and dry and later has this sort of late water delivery. So, you know, maybe for around the white dwarf system, yes, the white dwarf's gonna be very hot at first, but perhaps these sort of disintegrating gas giants can provide some volatiles to the white, to the white dwarf planet later on. So again, this is pure speculation, but I mean, we have scientific theories to back it up. Yeah. Well, speculation is where we all start. And that's one of the really exciting things about white dwarf planets in that it's such an unknown area because we've only just found the first clear transiting planet around a white dwarf that we'll actually be able to start getting answers to these questions in the near term future. So in particular, let's say that we do find a rocky planet around a white dwarf in the future, even if it turns out that it is not possible to have a second genesis of an atmosphere and we just get a ball of rock, or even if you can get an atmosphere, maybe the planets don't have life. But we don't need to speculate forever because we will actually be able to test these ideas by obtaining observations of the spectra of these planets. So uh, there was another question that relates to this. So about the technology to get spectra of planets around white dwarfs. And one of the things that I find most, most cool and exciting about planets around white dwarfs is that they are, their atmospheres are so easy to get high quality spectra of that it's almost like you can, you're, you're jumping a generation ahead of telescope technology by looking at a white dwarf planet. So the quality of spectra that we could obtain for a white dwarf planet using something like James Webb, I mean, the way I like to imagine it is that's almost Louvois level constraints. So Louvois would be potentially the next generation telescope that would come after James Webb if it's selected around 2035 or so. Maybe so, have more wavelength range. Yeah, oh, of course, of course. Yeah, and James Webb can push all the way out to 12 microns like into the, well, would that be mid-infrared? Yeah, it can push out um, to much longer wavelengths. So there's, yeah, so white dwarf planets are fantastic because it lets us, um, it gives us a way to preview the future path of the development of technology. And so anything we learn from white dwarf planets, even if we find that they're all dead, that still tells us something fundamental about the origin of life in the universe. So, um, so yeah, so the technology is much simpler than it has to be. And that's why we're, we're really excited about the prospects for characterizing such objects. Okay, so let's see what other questions do you have? Do, 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 do. Let's see. So, Perhaps this is one for Thea. How would the frequency of revolution of the planets affect the prospects for life? So I assume they mean the rotational speed or, or orbital speed. I don't know which. Yeah, so yeah, because I could interpret that as either the short orbital period of the planet or instead the sort of lack of rotation of the planet because it would likely be tidally locked. So both of those I think are very interesting. So if you think about the tidal locking, so again, this is just the planet would have a permanent day side and night side. That'd be very interesting for life. So as I briefly mentioned earlier, if the planet had a thick atmosphere, 
there's a chance the circulation would be really good on the planet. So we'd have the heat from the day side being transported over to the night side. Because we have quite a bit of atmospheric circulation here on Earth. So Earth, you know, we ha it has the 24 hour rotation period and we have these circulation cells. We have these circulation cells called the Hadley cells at the equator. So they bring hot air up from the equator to plus or minus 30 degrees longitude latitude on Earth. And that's creating the tropics. But if the planet rotation slowed down, these circulation cells would encapsulate the whole planet. So you're taking the hot air from the equator and you're just transporting it the whole planet. So the whole planet might actually be a very similar temperature and that might be better for life with a more stable temperature. If we're thinking more about the short orbital period, so basically a year for this planet would happen twice a day by Earth standard. So that would be really interesting. So if the planet is tilted at all, so Earth has like a 23 degree axial tilt and that causes the seasons you would, you know, seasons would last just a few hours and it would just constantly be changing. So that would be interesting for a lot of different reasons. Sorry, this is an interesting question. I'm just trying to think about it more. Um, so yeah, the short orbital period, I think what's really interesting when you think about life in the universe is we're not really sure what helps life or what doesn't help life. Because for instance, we have our seasons here on earth and some people say, oh, that helps life. It made it easier for us to be able to adapt to different temperatures in different situations because we had to. Whereas some people say, oh, if we didn't have seasons, it would have been easier for life to emerge because we wouldn't have had to adapt to different weather. So that's sort of the fun thing about astrobiology is you could sort of come up with a reason for why anything would be better or worse for life. And in the end, what we have to do is find life in the universe to confirm these ideas. So life would definitely be different around these planets, both because of the slow rotation of the planet and the very fast year. But I don't see any reasons why that would hurt life or any reasons why that would particularly make it easier for life. But they're definitely very interesting questions. And if we can find some earth size planets around white dwarfs in the habitable zones, we'll be able to look into their atmospheres and start to see what the answers to those questions actually are. You may be I muted. can't hear you, Ryan. Would not have been online if someone hadn't been muted. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, a related question that we got on Thea Twitter, uh, uh, on, <laughs> on Twitter Thea, right. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> if you were on a rocky planet around a white dwarf, what would you see? Like, how would the white dwarf itself look different from the sun? So, when I looked into this for the first time, it was because my good friend, Dr. Jack Madden, was doing an artist conception of my research. So, a lot of these beautiful animations Brian has been showing were made by Jack. Um, we wanted to calculate what the size of the white dwarf would be in the sky of a habitable zone planet. And we were thinking, oh, the white dwarf is very small, but it's very close. So maybe it'll be huge in the sky or really small in the sky. And it was actually a bit disappointing for us that it turns out if you are in the habitable zone of a white dwarf, it's going to look pretty much the same size in the sky as the sun does to us. I also found, because the other part of my research was studying habitable zone planets around red giants, so when our sun becomes a red giant, Jupiter and Saturn will enter the habitable zone. And we were finding that even though the red giant is huge, the habitable zone is so far away that the red giant is also about the same size as the sun in the sky. So it wouldn't unfortunately look like a cool sci-fi story where you've got either this huge star in the sky or a really small star that's still heating you. It probably wouldn't look that different than here. And if the white dwarf was about the same temperature as Earth, and we always call them white dwarfs, but the color of the star is actually dependent on the temperature. So if we were around a planet, I mean, around a white door, the, si the same temperature as the sun, it would mainly just look like the sun in the sky. We can imagine it looks cooler though, but scientifically it would just look like the sun in the sky. And we, we've just had a very interesting question. So I think, Andrew, would you like to take the first part of this question in terms of the, the future of research in planetary systems surrounding white dwarfs. And then I'll take the second part about um, timescales for discoveries with James Webb. 
Sure. Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of stuff we can learn from white dwarfs. So one of the first things I want to do is learn more about this particular planet. We want to learn how massive it is. We don't really have a good idea just how much heft it has. It could be up to about 15 times the mass of Jupiter, but it could be about the mass of Jupiter or even less. And figuring that out will really help us figure out, I think, how it actually got there to begin with. We, of course, want to keep looking for more planets. We've been talking mostly about Earth-sized planets, but we don't have one yet. So let's see if we can change that. And then the thing that we haven't really talked about yet, because we're focusing here on planets where we might go around and walk on the surface, is what about the planets that have been destroyed? What can they tell us? And this is actually a huge opportunity, I think. Even in our own solar system, we cannot drill into the core of a planet and figure out what it's made of. We can't drill into the core of the Earth. We have to kind of guess what it's made of based on what other stuff in our solar system seems to be made up of. With a white dwarf, though, we can actually do this. We can see planets that have been torn apart or destroyed, and then they've had their elemental makeup smeared on the surface of these white dwarfs. So for perhaps the first time, we can use white dwarfs to really understand what planets are made of on the inside throughout our galaxy. And I think that that's a really important opportunity to help us understand planets in our solar system and beyond, even if they're not around white dwarfs. And we finally managed to actually get the, the visual up of the, uh, the planet that Andrew discovered. And I think one of the things that still boggles my mind and amazes me about this discovery here is that the planet itself is seven times larger than the object that it's orbiting. Um, I mean, it doesn't really come across in this animation here. I think in this visual, it's maybe two times larger, but yeah, it's just, sometimes discoveries in astronomy really blow your mind. I, I think that the NASA Exoplanet Archive also had, um, yeah, some interesting issues having a planet which was larger than its star. <laughs> So uh, anyhow, the, the second part of that question was about um, how long would it take to chance upon a significant discovery once James Webb is launched? So if we find a rocky planet around a white dwarf, which appears to be a good target before James Webb is ready, and by good target, I mean it's within around 200 light years or so of Earth. In that case, it's remarkably quick, actually. So our study found that you would only need to observe the um, you would only need to observe these transit events five times in order to detect the presence of water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmospheres of one of these planets, and that alone would be an incredibly significant discovery to know that you have water in the atmosphere of a planet in the habitable zone of a dead star. But you actually only need to observe for a little bit longer than that, up to 25 transits, to be able to start looking for whether or not there are potential biosignatures in the atmosphere. So to put that in context, a rocky planet in the habitable zone of a white dwarf, its orbital period, its year is about 10 hours. So the total amount of time James Webb would have to observe for, it would be about a two week observing campaign with James Webb to potentially be able to tease out the signatures of, of biological activity if indeed there is life and the planets have an atmosphere, which are still open questions. So the, the essential point is if there are rocky planets around a white dwarf and that have something going on in their atmosphere, which is interesting, it would just be a matter of weeks for us to um, discover it. When the equivalent amount of time for planets around um, red dwarf stars, for example, you're then looking at months to years because it takes a week for every transit and you still and the signals are much weaker than for white dwarf planets. So we can move much, much quicker for planets around white dwarfs. Um, that being said, we will we will still get incredible discoveries from planets around other stars um, like red dwarf stars and even main sequence stars from James Webb. White dwarf planets will just be the low hanging fruit if we can actually find them. So fingers crossed. And uh, yes, I did just say two weeks, two weeks to find uh, life in the universe. 
It's just uh, we need Andrew to go and find one of these planets for us, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, hopefully they exist. Okay, so um, here's a great question from Paul here about uh, studying planets which are not edge on and not close in to their star. So I can take a little bit of this one. So we already have. So there, there are many ways that we can characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets. Perhaps the easiest one conceptually is called direct imaging. It's exactly what we do if we want to look at Jupiter's atmosphere, for example. You point a telescope at Jupiter, you get a spectrum, and then you see what it's made of. That's really hard to do for exoplanets because their star is just so bright. Uh, for an Earth-like planet, it's 10 billion times brighter. But it turns out that if we have very young planets, around 100 million years old or so, orbiting about as far out as Neptune, then those planets are bright enough in the infrared because of the, the heat that they're shining in from their formation that we can use instruments called coronagraphs to like block out the light from the star and still directly see the planet. So we don't need the planet to transit. So these would be planets that are far out and non-transiting, and uh, we can we already have spectra for some of them. Um, so so yeah, we, we can already do that. And um, there are also techniques. Um, there's a technique called high-resolution Doppler spectroscopy that we can use to detect molecules for non-transiting close-in planets, like the um, the first hot Jupiter discovered in 1995, 51 Pegasi b water has been discovered in the atmosphere of that planet using this technique. So we do have some creative methods, so we won't just be constrained to planets that just happen to be transiting. But it is, it's important that you mention that there, Paul, because even if there are rocky planets in the habitable zone of white dwarfs, the probability of them being aligned to transit is only about 1%. So, um, yeah. Fortunately, transiting planets are not the only avenue that we have to go and do this. So I, we've just got a few minutes left. So I think if any of you have any last minute burning questions, please do drop them into the chat. But uh, while waiting for those, um, I'm curious about any parting thoughts that the two of you have or anything you'd really like to, uh, to get across to our listeners today. So uh, would you like to start, uh, Thea? Sure. So I think that what's really exciting about planets around these white dwarfs is exactly what you're just saying, Ryan, is that if we find one of these planets and we have JWST launch, we'll know within two weeks if there's life on that planet. And I think that's, I mean, it really sounds like science fiction, but it is actually not fiction. We've gone over the calculations many times to prove that. So a lot of what we're trying to encourage right now is for people to try to look for these planets around white dwarfs. So we're very thankful for people like Andrew. And we know that because so much of the star would be blocked with the planet transiting white dwarf, luckily even ground-based telescopes will be able to see these planets as well. So just knowing that because of this small size of the white dwarf that we could find life faster than around any potential other type of planet is really exciting. So. I think we should definitely give this a try. Andrew, any parting thoughts? Yeah, I think that what I'm excited about is we've thought, you know, Thea's, Thea's been thinking about can white dwarfs have life around them for her entire thesis. And in order for us to know if that's true, there's like a checklist of things we have to figure out. We have to understand can planets survive becoming a red giant. We have to understand, can planets survive moving in? We have to understand, can small planets do this? And then can life start again? And this discovery, I think, has checked off one of those major checks on the checklist. And I think that that's why I'm really excited to see if we can push this further. Can we figure out if this is actually true, if this is actually a way for us to understand a new way for life to exist in our galaxy? Yeah, I think it's it's just so fascinating to think how close we could be to our very first chance to start searching for life in the universe. And it all comes when James Webb launches. So knowing that we are 
the first generation that has a, a real chance, scientifically speaking, to know whether or not we are alone in the universe. I think that's that's incredibly humbling, and I can't wait to find out what the answer is. And And I should say that we might not get lucky with James Webb. Um, the mission will only be up there for so many years, and if life is intrinsically rare, we might not find any signatures of it. But that would still be informative, knowing whether or not life is common or rare. And um, so I think a perhaps a nice final thing would be um, for each of us to estimate how long we think it will take until we find the first claimed biosignature in exoplanet atmosphere. As we as we know from this past week, uh, there's a long way to go from claiming a biosignature knowing that you have life. So uh, I, I will start by saying that I would be surprised if we don't have a claim of a biosignature within, within 10 years of James Webb launching. So yeah, so 2032 or so is when I'd be very surprised we haven't got some evidence. 10 years sounds about right to me. I think that there will be a claim from James Webb of a biosignature around a red dwarf. I think that that claim will not be strong enough for us to really believe until maybe 20 years after that when the next generation of telescopes launches. But if it's around a white dwarf, then maybe so, because we'll have so much better access to quality data. So I think a white dwarf could be the shortcut to really believing this. Yes, I agree with both Ryan and Andrew that yes, the white dwarf is sort of a sh shortcut for finding life. Although I also believe that there will probably be claims of life, but validating them is going to be very difficult. So for those of you who know, there is a paper this past week with a claim of a biosignature in Venus's atmosphere. And that's gonna be hard for us to validate even though Venus is by astronomical standards right there. So we're not going to be able to send any probes to an exoplanet atmosphere. It's going to be hard enough within our solar system to confirm if there's life or not. So I personally think that we're going to find proof of life in our solar system, strong proof or you know, confirmation before we find it in an exoplanet atmosphere. But I think it's important that we try both ways to look for life in the universe. Although finding something in an exoplanet atmosphere is going to be a lot harder to prove to people. And most of the time when I ask other astronomers what would convince them of life on another planet, they usually say they'd want a radio message from them. So, and that can happen any day now. We can dream so, well. What we can do is uh, keep developing these new instruments which are more sensitive than ever yeah. before, keep looking, and given the incredible pace of discovery in exoplanets, um, over the last 10, 20 years. Um, and that pace doesn't seem to be showing any signs of slowing down. I think it will be sooner rather than later that we start to see these these first signs. But as Andrew says, the first claim of a biosignature will take a long time to, to verify. You need to know much more about the context of the planet that it came from. So it'll just be the start of our journey, finding the first potential biosignature, not the end. And um, yeah, I think we're all very excited about the prospects. So thank you very much for joining everyone. And um, please join me in the chat with uh, thanking, um, uh, well, all of our, our three uh, speakers today, <laughs> including myself. Um, so um, yeah, uh, we hope you found this informative. We're going to uh, sign off for now. If you are watching the recording of this live stream, don't worry, we will still be monitoring the questions in the chat. So please do uh, drop any remaining questions that you have or tweet to us um, at uh, the Carl Sagan Institute and we'll be uh, more than happy to answer your questions. But uh, with that, uh, bye for now, everyone, and uh, hope you enjoyed the live stream.